together ultimately and put them into one large file this takes it takes a while to do that so here's the bank icon and what it's created is a table can you read the table now okay. now the the, the, the the design of the program reflects my own learning process I didn't know the importance of assets liabilities and equity until after I've started designing it so we have a, a possibility for single entry there and we don't actually make things strictly assets lives and liabilities and equity uh, at the later stage I'm going to fix that but let's let's have got reserves here can you read the text? Reserves as an asset. Another asset I'll call loans. And then I'll have another, now I have a liability from the bank's point of view, which I'll call deposits. And then finally, we're going to have the equity of the bank. And I'll just call that bank. Ah, pardon me, press the mouse in the wrong spot. Notice what's happening now is down the bottom. The program's adding these little uh, elements coming out the bottom of the, uh, the icon for the bank itself. And now let's say we've got say we've got say 10 in reserves and 50 in loans, and the program is telling you the row sum so so is 60. So you've got to have a matching negative entries there. So I'm showing 50 in deposits, minus 50 from the bank's point of view, and minus 10 is bank equity, which is a positive for the bank, but shown as a negative. Now, what happens when a loan's created? Well, it's simple. The bank says they can go to uh, create a loan. So you're going to lend money, and I'll just use the word lend here. And the program says, well, to balance it, you've got to have a minus lend somewhere. So put minus lend there. Let's pay interest on the loan. So you're going to have an interest payment. Now, an interest payment is going to be a positive entry in your deposit account, which since it's negative, it reduces the size of the entry. And then it's going to go to the bank. So I put minus interest over here, which means the bank's earning income. That's increasing the bank's uh, equity. And then finally, let's say you repay the loan. Well, in that case, you're going to have a positive entry in your account, which reduces its size, but that means a negative entry against the loan. Make sense? Okay. What have I done with reserves there? Absolutely nothing. Okay. I've shown lending, paying interest and repayment without even touching the reserve column. That's what banks actually do. So the whole thing I did, they need reserves, is a fallacy. They don't need reserves at all. Why do you think they have them in the first place? Bank loans. Bank loans. Bank, bank loans. Bank loans? Runs. Runs. Yes, partly bank runs, that's true. Because if you want your money in cash, let's just actually, I'll add one more element here. Let's say we're now looking at the, the, the uh, public's point of view. So I'll just call this one here, I'll call this the banks. It's just a label. And I'll call this households, let's say, also just a label. And let's take a look at the same situation from their point of view. So what assets can they have? Well, remember, in, 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 in accounting, some, an asset for somebody is a liability for somebody else. Okay. So you notice the little down arrow there. Minsky is a software package. We now look around, and if I click on that arrow, say, what liabilities haven't been allocated to somebody as an asset yet? I click on that, it's going to tell me deposits haven't been allocated. If I click on deposits there, it brings across all the operations. So that's an asset. What about liabilities? Well, let's say what liabilities. I click on this little down arrow, it's going to say what assets haven't been allocated as a liability to somebody else. Loans and reserves. Now, reserves, of course, are an asset of the banks themselves, so they're not going to be a liability to the household sector. They bring across loans. And notice those operations have been transferred across, so two of the three rows are okay. So what I need to do now is add, a, add an additional row and say, let's just have equity here. And let's call this households. And then show the interest payments are going from the household's equity account and coming out of the deposit account. So it's reduced, the interest payments reduce the household sector's equity. Make sense? Okay. So there we've got the same from the point of view of the, um, the, the banks. Now, the other thing I haven't shown here I'll bring down another icon and I'll call this um, other banks. It's just it's, it's badly labeled, but that'll do other banks because I've got reserves here. Let's just call this reserves for B1, for bank one. So that's reserves for one bank. And this is come across here and say that this bank has reserves for bank two, 
and then it has let's just give it a uh, say I'll call this firms imagining the firms are the ones who bank here firms deposit accounts and finally the equity of B2 I did my bad. Let's make this. Was, pardon me, this is a little um, hassle. I'll call this just B2, just for short, for its equity. And just delete that column that turned up there automatically. Now, what reserves are actually used for are transfers between different banks. So if I now, let's put the central bank in here as well. And say, so what assets are here? Well, what are the liabilities that haven't been allocated yet? Um, the, 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 let's just say loans, so CB, I'll call this CB loans, loan to B1, and then say CB loan to B2. I'm labeling this badly, but I think you'll get the general idea. And then what are the what liabilities are in the system? Well, those are assets. There's reserves for B1 and reserves for B2. Now, if you imagine the household sector shops at Lloyd's and the firm sector shops at Barclays, then if you want to make a purchase from your bank account to uh, make a purchase from the, the, the firm sector, money has to be transferred between Barclays and Lloyd's. So reserves for those banks play exactly the same role as your own deposit accounts do. So if you want to buy something off each other and you're in the one bank, it's just a transfer between two bank accounts at the same bank and no reserves need to be used. But if you want to make the transfer between Lloyd's Bank, you bank at Lloyd's, somebody else banks at Barclays, then the reserves have to shift as well. So reserves are like bank accounts for banks. So they're, they're for runs, as you said, and they're there also for the banks to do internal settlement. They're not useful lending at all. It's just a myth, an economic myth. So when I put it together, that's the sort of pattern you see. If you actually model at the aggregate level of the banking sector, lending creates deposits and repayment reduces deposits. Reserves play no role at all. And I want to show you a bit more detail on why this why this happens, what happens when you actually try to show what's going on. Now, what I've done here is say, if you, if you increase the assets by a loan, you increase the liabilities by the deposit as well, and the row about sums to zero, which is what's necessary. Okay, so that's all correct accounting. Nothing wrong with that. Let's try putting the money multiplier inside there. So what you have is you're lending out of reserves. So I'll do that with a new, I'll just create a new one now. I won't save that. Let's say we try to model using accounting. Ah, program crashes. Math Minsky is a new piece of development software. And unfortunately, with the development software, you can have bugs and it crashes, and that's just happened there. So I'll just bring up Task Manager and shut it down. Let's just end that task. And then end this one. And I'll start it again. One of the hassles when you're developing software for the first time. Plenty of bugs. Okay, here we go. I'm going to try to model. Hang on. I'm going to try to model fractional reserve banking, as it's called. The idea is you're going to lend out something inside your reserves. So we're going to have an asset here called reserves. Another asset called loans, and then a liability account with deposit where the loans actually go, and then the bank equity. And let's call this bank. Now let's give the same. Let's say there's a hundred in reserves, uh, nothing in loans. So say minus ninety for bank for for deposits and minus ten for bank equity. And then you want to lend from reserves. What's that going to do to reserves if you lend from reserves? Positive or negative? Negative. Okay. I'll call it LFR for lend from reserves. And if I want to actually put money inside somebody's deposit account, what do I need to have there? I need another negative, don't I? Because I said it's a, the deposits are a negative. If you actually want to lend from reserves to deposits, 
then I need to have a negative entry to show that I've increased the size of the deposits because from the bank's point of view, that's a liability. Therefore, it's grown. So I need to type this in. But the program tells me your accounting is bad. You wrote us and sum to zero. There's a mistake. So how can I make it sum properly? Well, I've got to have a plus there. Then it sums properly, but it's now nonsense. Okay. The only way I can make it make sense is if I lend from here. Then it makes sense. Okay. You cannot lend out reserves. Now let's go a bit more. That's 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 a very basic look at it. It just is bad accounting. If you say lending from reserves, you're taking that means you, you put reserves to fall. And you can see that's what the Federal Reserve is expecting in all its dialogue. Remember all those comments? They thought reserves would go down if there's lending going on and they're not falling, so they can't be lending. But if you actually have a fall in reserves, which I've shown here, then you make an accounting error. It's simply wrong according to a professional accounting. You're looking pretty stunned there. Surely one decides how to run a firm by itself, is it not? You don't necessarily need... There's nothing stopping me lending out reserves physically. I can't type this in weekly and... No. Something if somebody comes to your bank, you can say, look, you want a million? Here's a million dollars. And then cash over the... It's got to be cash to handle the reserves. Okay? But if you give it to somebody and they start walking out the door, you go, say, hang on a second. I haven't written down that you owe me money. Okay, so how do you do that? That's the next stage I'm looking at. Let's just imagine now we're going to go back to the stage of the Fed creating excess reserves and see how it actually all works through. So you create the excess reserves. What? What's the point of having them there? You need them for runs because the public wants cash rather than like in Cyprus, okay, or Northern Rock. The reserves are there so that if people come up and say, I want my money now, you can give them cash and they walk away without causing a runaway panic. If you went to the bank and they said, sorry, no cash, that would actually accentuate the panic. So it's, you want them for reserves, but you also want them for doing transactions between banks. You think about banks in terms of a pyramid. Okay, if you're, uh, you're buying something off somebody else, you're the buyer, that's the seller, the bank does the transfer. Okay? But if you <coughs> bank with one bank and the person banks with another, there's another triangle over here, so you've got to put a triangle on top of that. And then what you have is the reserves for one bank, reserves for the other, and the central bank. Okay? But think about monetary transactions as a triangular arrangement and it'll make a lot of sense and it shows you why this model doesn't work. So what I'm going to show here, let's say imagine the bank, the central bank has created excess reserves, just what Bernanke did back in 2009. So he's created excess reserves. There's a loan by the central bank to the private banks and that balances the, the loans, the assets that the central bank has have risen, the reserves of the private banks have risen. So, so far we're okay in accounting terms. But looking in the private bank, what you see there is their reserves have risen and they've got a debt to the central bank. So this was an asset here for the central bank. It's a liability over here for the private banks. This was a, a liability for the central bank here. It's an asset here. Okay, it's all correct so far. Nothing wrong with doing the accounting this way at all so far. And the row sum is zero. So now I've got it right. Now, can they? what it implies is they can't lend out of the asset, but could they lend out of the liability? Okay. Looks possible. Okay, you certainly can't lend from the asset itself because you don't. You want if you lend from the asset, your asset goes down. If you're trying to create a loan. You want your assets to rise, so you want to have the, maybe you can lend out of your liabilities instead. Well, let's do that. So now you say let's lend out of the central bank loan. Whereabouts are we? So that there's a positive entry which reduces your liability to the central bank. You've now got an increased liability to the deposit account because you've created a loan over there. So far, so good. That sums to zero. All fine. What's the problem? You've given the money away. You haven't recorded a loan. There's no debt. How do you make a loan without debt? Okay. You give money to the borrower, but you haven't recorded it. Why can't you just make another column saying... Good idea. Let's do that. Okay. So they're not giving money away for free. Let's just record another from reserves on the next line. Let's do that. So now you have, okay, we've lent you that amount of money, but we're now going to record it over here as a loan. Now, to get it correct, there's your increase in asset, 
with a positive, you've got to match it by an increase in your liabilities with a negative. So you do that. What's now happened to your lending from reserves? You've got plus and minus lend, you've cancelled it out. It's superfluous. You don't actually need the reserves to lend. Now you can do lots of other permutations. I've been trying to do them before the lecture, and I just I get I get a mess because it's wrong. You know, the program just starts objecting, not 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 by sort of screaming at me, but by giving me negative sums on on the row on the row somewhere it should be zero, or putting rows where they shouldn't be, and so on. Because it's simply I'm trying to force something that doesn't happen. that every time you do it, either reserves play no role or you get an accounting error. So the standard model is nonsense. And that's because economists haven't learned about money properly because their macroeconomic theories leave money out. And therefore money is like a, a footnote for them. But suddenly that footnote has become the entire text because they're trying to drive the economy up by controlling the money supply, but they don't honestly know how to do it. And the reason they don't know how to do it is they've never given, never, never treated money seriously in the first place. So they don't know the accounting principles behind it, and therefore they haven't checked to see whether their model actually makes sense in a in an accounting format. And the thing is, you cannot lend out those excess reserves because they're not used for lending. They're used to settle accounts between different banks, and so that boosts your excess reserves at almost nothing. It's it did stop the banks losing liquidity. They had a huge increase in their assets and their liabilities, but liabilities out to the central bank, so the central bank could be forgiving about those liabilities, so it made the banks more liquid. It stopped a meltdown, but it did bugger all, unfortunately, pardon the technical term, for increasing the amount of money in the economy and actually stimulating the real economy. Now, QE, what's QE? Well, QE is... Pardon? <laughs> QE is quantitative easing, that's correct. Hey, sorry. <laughs> Uh, actually, I really appreciate how you guys dived into that discussion with Daniel last week. I thought it was great. It really made it stimulating for him as well. So thanks for engaging as much as you did with him um, and me as well in all these classes. Uh, so what QE is, it's it's the same sort of thing, but now they're buying assets off the, off the private banks. Either they're government bonds that the banks themselves have bought previously and they're using them as income-earning assets, or it's bonds the banks have created in things like mortgage-backed securities and so on. And if you take a look in the um, the English, the Bank of England will tell you the, the breakup of what they've actually done. And there's two ways you can do QE. You can do it with banks only. I think the Americans are largely sticking to that. Or you can do it with non-bank financial institutions, things like pension funds, insurance funds in Australia, superannuation funds and so on, as well as with banks. And that does give you a different type of reaction. Now, what they were trying to do with QE, there were two things they were trying to do. One is to reduce interest rates across the whole yield curve. So if you look at what normally happens with bank with uh, central bank operations, they're buying short-term government bonds. Here they're buying long-term government bonds and they're buying mortgage-backed securities as well that might have a 25-year lifespan. They're trying to reduce interest rates right across the board and that they have done because there's such huge buy pressure. When you buy bonds, you drive up their price and you drive down the yield. Okay, so they have to some extent flattened the yield curve. But they wanted also to encourage banks to buy what they call risky assets. And that's things like shares. Well, it's, it's not houses. Like banks can't go out and buy houses directly. But they can go and buy shares. Or they can buy bonds issued by other companies and finance. They can buy bonds off uh, a private corporation like you know Tesla or General Motors or what's the um, English Dyson? They could buy bonds off Dyson. But they normally create mortgage-backed securities and sell those instead. And they thought they'd increase consumer spending by what they call the, the wealth effect. Is any South Park fans here? Yes. Okay. You remember this episode with the gnomes? Yeah. Okay. Collect underpants. Another what happens. Bang. Profit. Well, that's not actually the um, diagram that the central bank used, but I've got a feeling it's got similarities. Okay. So what they've got here, the Bank of England, the whole the theory of the transmission channels the Bank of England put together in this diagram, and I think I've linked – I haven't actually linked the – I think I've linked on this one. Let's see. Oh, that's known as South Park. Pardon me. Okay. But there, there is a Bank of England document I have linked to. So what they have is the Bank of England does asset purchases here, and they think, we're going to increase confidence. Yay. People are going to love the fact we're stealing their underpants. Uh, policy sitting. We're going to show what we want to do. 
portfolio rebalancing, where we're going to take um, assets out of, buy assets off you and force you to buy other assets. So you've got to shuffle your portfolio around. Market liquidity, we're going to increase the amount of money. And money, we're going to increase the amount of money. And that's going to cause to, um, pardon me, asset prices will rise and the exchange rate will, will uh, be affected. Bank lending will increase. There'll be more wealth. Borrowing costs will fall. Spending income will rise. We'll get inflation at 2%. Okay. Well, we know this doesn't work. I've shown you the bank lending doesn't work at all. This doesn't work with shares. The funny thing is I've, I've linked to an article by the Federal Reserve here uh, where they, oh, hang on a sec, what happened there? Here we go. How important is the stock market on consumer spending? And their conclusion was not at all. They said there is a, they could find a wealth effect for housing. They couldn't find one for shares. So there's another part of the thing which is a bit like the underpants of the, uh, of, uh, of uh, South Park. And then when you look at spending and income causing inflation to hit 2%, well, it's taken how many years have they been doing this for now? And it's other, other factors are causing inflation to rise, the devaluation of the pound being the obvious factor. So maybe the first diagram was more accurate. Okay. By the way, I have a lot of time for the Bank of England in general. I think you all know that uh, because they're more aware of the problems and they're more frank about them. So the basic effect of QE, let's see what it actually was. First of all, what you're doing is getting the private banks to sell an income earning asset they've got to you as the, as the central bank. That might be government bonds, which might be yielding, say, 2 or 3%. They could be mortgage-backed securities, which you claim are yielding 5%. They could be bonds from some company, which might be yielding, say, 6 or 7%. So that's income-earning assets. So you sell it, and you get a non-income-earning asset in return. You get reserves if you're a bank or if you're a I – mean, and that, of course, doesn't create any money, as I've shown you already. It just creates additional excess reserves. And it therefore drops. But you look at your own balance sheet, you have exactly the same quantity of, of assets – <laughs> given the price you've sold the, the bonds for, but the income earning numbers have gone down and the non-income earning, which are the reserves, have gone up, which motivates you to buy shares in commercial bonds and stuff like that if you're a bank. Now, what happens if you buy them? What happens to your reserves? What happens to individual banks' reserves if they buy shares? Well, they decrease. Pardon? They decrease. They decrease. They decrease. What about the banking system? When the share broker gets the shares... Where does he put the money? The Back in another bank. Okay, it just goes between banks. They can't actually, the only way you can get reserves out of the banking system is, is two ways. Either the central bank sells bonds to you and takes the cash back that way, or the public takes money out in cash form. They're just wrong about how you can get rid of the reserves. So if they, if they simply buy these assets, then the reserves will circulate amongst the banks. One bank's reserves will fall if they're buying off a broker who banks at a different bank. But the bank where the broker banks, the reserves will rise. So I just circulate. It's a classic hot potato. It gets passed from one person to another. It doesn't disappear. So you can't withdraw those, reduce those reserves, unless you either withdraw them as cash or you uh, or the central bank sells, sells bonds to you and buys the, and buys the, uh, the, bond, the uh, reserves back. Now, if you buy them off a non-bank, then the non-bank is going to bank at a bank. Okay. The non-bank, like a pension fund, will have an account at a private bank. So that will increase its deposits, and that creates money. Well, what, can the, what can a pension fund do with that money? Can it buy a Lamborghini? Okay. It, can, it, can, you know, it can pay one of its employees enough to buy a Lamborghini. Okay, So that's where the money – but they can't go and buy consumer items. All they can buy is more financial assets. So they go and buy financial assets as well. So that does cause higher asset prices. It's pushing up. It's reducing the yield on other assets like bonds. That alone encourages you to go and do the portfolio readjustment they're talking about and buy shares. It encourages you to buy shares because you've got non-income earning reserves now or deposits. You want to convert that for income earning assets. So it does drive up asset prices. But it has very little impact on the non-financial economy because it does. the only way it actually gets into the, into the uh, real economy is when you purchase those assets, like buying shares, you're buying them off a firm that has is making a profit as a brokerage firm. So it has profits for its shareholders and partners. It has employees paid outrageous salaries, and they get those outrageous salaries and they can go shopping. Okay, so that reaches the real economy, but it's rather than being an amplifier, like the usual sort of the money multiplies, like a you know you push on a little lever and a huge gush of 
money comes out. Instead, it's a dribble. You pour a large amount of money in and a tiny amount dribbles out to the real economy. So the scale of what they're doing is literally the order, and I think in the English case, of 400 billion pounds. But the actual amount of impact on the economy might be 5 or 10% of that. So, um, and I'll just, uh, I've got a couple of examples where I've, I've started bringing it up. I'll see if I can find them for you because I've got to the end of the slides faster than I thought I would. Let's just take a look at uh, the basic structure of QE I've got here. So let's look at it all. So I can make that. Okay. So what I've got here is the central bank doing a whole range of things. I've got the they're buying government bonds from the banks. So that means it's the, its assets increase by quantitative easing, buying government bonds from private banks. Of course, that's on the asset side of the central bank ledger. So you need a negative entry on the liability side, and that's on the reserves. Okay. Then you have buying pr private bonds from banks. That's quantitative easing, private, pri buying private bonds from private banks. Then I have QE. Is it just a bit confusing because we've got QE, um, PV, PV. Oh, no, I know it's a bit. I know that's that's private banks, private bonds from private banks. It's a bit. I realised that when I wrote it, but uh, I was in a hurry. So but that's the basic idea. Uh, you notice what Minsky is doing here, by the way, superscripts and subscripts, just to try to make it easier to understand what's going on, a bit like a mathematical notation. But in every last case, it's exactly the same looking operation for the central bank doing it. All it's doing is pumping money into reserves. Well, to see what actually happens to that, you've got to go across to the private banks and see what differs. And if they're doing it, let's just make the top a little bit wider there. I still need to make a bit more space. Let's see. This, by the way, this is the spreadsheet we use here is actually not written by my programmer or me. It's written by a third party and it's not very good. We're going to see if we can replace it if I get more funding to keep on working on the software. Let's just, if I can pull this across a bit so you can see the whole screen. Not quite there yet. That's the, the row. The row sum is zero. So just making sure I've showed the row sums is zero there. So quanti if quantitative easing buying government bonds off private banks, increases the reserves of private banks. It doesn't put any money into the real economy. And did over buying private bonds off them. So that's just an asset shuffle on the on the asset side of the private banks. On the other hand, buying government bonds from non-bank financial institutions increases the reserves of the private banks and increases their liabilities as well, which is the size of the bank accounts. So then you can add a few more operations. You can't have anything happening by the banks actually turning up on the real economy. But if you imagine... If there's, let's say, uh, let's say broker, let's say NBFI pays wages, then what you might have over here is wages uh, for for uh, brokers here. Uh, spell correctly, Steve. Wages for brokers there, which turn up as a deposit account entry here. Now, that's got out of the financial sector, which is over here, and turned up on the real economy. But it's dribble. It's a fraction of the money being created by QE. So rather than being a strong way of stimulating the economy, it's quite trivial. And this is one reason why the recovery has been so so trivial for all the, the length of time it's taken. It's the slowest recovery, even slower than the Great Depression, particularly for England, but also for America. It's because they're using policies that don't work. So that's that's the basic story, and that's down. If you want to have a play with Minsky, download it and have a play away. I've got a, a lot more, much more detailed model I'll show you here, which I've been working on, haven't yet finished. But this one is also using Minsky to model the actual dynamics of the whole thing. That doesn't make any sense. Pardon? That doesn't make any sense. I know, I know. I'm not going to try to explain it either. But what I've what I've got happening is the fact I've been saying what are what are the values of here? This this imagine QE is um, it's, a, it's a continuous growth in the, in the loans of the central bank. And um, the interest payments are based on how much of the loans are outstanding. The brokers are buying shares. The shares are yielding dividends. Uh, the poor people are getting some money to consume because they clean the Lamborghinis, etc., etc. Uh, but it's, it's, as you can see, it's quite a complicated model and it's only basically starting to write the whole thing. But the outcome is it's ineffective relatively ineffective. It's, it will simulate the economy a bit because of those spillover effects, but rather than being the big bonus that comes out of the fractional reserve banking model, it's a tiny stimulus.
So we're not being led by people who actually know how the economy functions. No, we never are. Never are. Good summary. Yeah. If you upload the slides and let's say you take one of the It'll bring down the, the Minsky model, yeah. See, what you should do is go to, if you just, I've got a link to Minsky in the presentation itself. So, see, I'll just go back to the. So, you'll see a link. Bang, bang, bang. Oh, I haven't got a link. Like, I can't spot a link there straight away. But there's a link here. If you click on that that link here, then that'll take you to SourceForge, and you can download the software from there. That's that's the the latest Windows version. I'm afraid the Mac version isn't very good. Oh, very fine. Sorry about that. The Mac the Mac. Do you, if you have um, what's it called the um, virtual Windows system on Mac, parallel. The trouble is the Mac has got a very complicated graphical interface between what our code and it, and it just doesn't work all that well. We're trying to fix it, but it's a, it's a pain. Yeah, so non-Mac people can have a good play. They download the software and install it, and when you install it and double-click or just click on any of the icons, so you'll see the icons. Let's see where they are here. Where are we? Okay, click on one of those icons. I'll show you what I mean. You click on, and that'll bring up the Minsky model, and double click on that, and you can see the entries. Okay? And so do learn the money multiplier, do reproduce it in principles, exams, and stuff like that. <coughs> but realize it doesn't work, okay? What you're learning as a model, some people think is important, you need to understand it, just it's a toy. Play with it, get the toy right, but real learning is different, and that's the beginning of seeing how it actually operates. Okay, guys, have a good five weeks or thereabouts. I'll see you in late March. I have a good talk with the rethinking crowd there as well. What is, what is the lecture in the, in the other parts about this? Pardon, sir? What is the lecture about? The other It'll be about where is economics going? So I'll have a, the rethinking group talking about what they're trying to do, and I'll also get you a summary of the state of economic theory right now. Well, we still have some. I feel we should be going down the toilet. Yes, I think. Question just a moment ago about the um, the essay, the, um, the auto liberal essay. Have you, have you all got started working on that? Okay. Uh, a lot of the material is going to be in German, which is, I mean, I know I know about the school from having read the history of economic thought in general. Um, but that's a good point about a lot of being in German. Use Google Translate. It's remarkable how good Google Translate is now. They've changed the algorithm in about the last year or so using what are called neural networks. And they're, they're really quite sophisticated at, at making it possible to understand even the phrasing. It'll change the phrasing to suit the difference between English uh, grammar and German grammar. So if you get an article you think it's worth reading, try Google Translate, see how that goes. Okay? Google Translate. Pardon? It's working better these days. If you haven't tried it in the last couple of couple of months, it's worth seeing. So let's take a look at what banks actually do, and I'm going to show you by using my program Minsky, which as I said you can download for free from the from the, the place called SourceForge. So what it does is it lets you it lets you do a lot of things, but one thing it lets you do is create a bank. And when you create the bank, if you, do, you right click or double click and go inside, you get what's called a godly table named after a guy called Win Godly. Unfortunately, I can't make the screen resolution.